let's get started. So what we now have the ability to do is to minimize a functional. And one of the most common ways that you encounter minimization problems is when you're trying to minimize something with some sort of uh, constraint. Let me give you an example. So here's an example. One of the, uh, in mechanics, biomechanics, biophysics, one of the places you continually see uses of variational calculus is in trying to describe the shapes of uh, red blood cells uh, and other lipid vesicles. Let me see if I can uh, I'll show you what I mean in case you're unfamiliar. So this is the kind of common shape that you see uh, over here on the right, um, where it says red blood cell cytoplasm containing hemoglobin. It's that kind of, um, it's almost like a, I don't know how to describe it. It's almost like a donut, but there's no hole. There's just kind of a, a, a uh, thin stretch of material kind of where there would be a hole in a, in a torus or a donut. That's what a healthy red blood cell looks like. But there are all sorts of uh, red blood cell shapes that can emerge when uh, either the cells are diseased or if they're um, encountering maybe an excess of salt. Uh, you probably heard it. This is a terrible graph. I can't see any of the words. Um, there we go. You probably heard of the term uh, sickle cell anemia. Um, and what is that, what that's describing is it's describing when your red blood cells adopt the shape of you know, this kind of sickle shape that's down at the bottom here. You see these burr shells, these teardrops. The shapes that these structures can take can vary dramatically. And so one of the problems in uh, biophysics is try to, to, to be able to determine what the shapes of these uh, structures would be. And oftentimes they're subjected to certain constraints. So for, in the case of a red blood cell, what you're typically doing is you're minimizing the, uh, the strain energy of that object. You're saying, okay, it's like a shell. We know how shells work. So we're gonna write down the strain energy of this object. We wanna find the shape. So ideally we'd like to minimize that strain energy, just like we did for the elastica. The challenge is that these are our cells, they're sacs. They're essentially like sacs that contain fluid. And often these sacs have additional constraints, not just the fact that they want to find uh, the shape that minimizes their bending energy. For instance, these, uh, these cells might be able to contain a fixed amount of fluid. So what you'd be saying is actually, I want to find the shape of this red blood cell. I'm going to minimize its, uh, its total potential energy but I'm going to constrain that minimization by saying, I got to find the shape that minimizes the energy, but, but I only want to think about shapes that all have the same volume. Another example could be, I would like to minimize the shape of this blood cell, but I'd like to only look at shapes that have the same surface area, because I know cells really can't stretch that much so their surface area is always going to be the same. So I only want to look at shapes that minimize the energy, but all have the same surface area. That last statement of shapes that minimize the energy, but maintain the same volume, shapes that minimize the energy, but maintain the same surface area, that those statements, those are the constraints that you're constraining your functional by. So that way you're only finding shapes that do both minimize the energy, but tell you what's happening when the, uh, the volume does not change. So 
this is a really common uh, occurrence in um, problems of variational calculus is how do you find the minimizer subjected to some constraint? We're gonna do this generically and we're gonna do it two ways. There's basically two approaches to, to doing this. The first approach is something you might've heard of before. I don't, I, I don't know, hopefully this is a familiar term. And it's what's referred to as the Lagrange multiplier method. And the idea here is that you take your constraint, you multiply it by some arbitrary constant, uh, and then you minimize the entire uh, functional. The arbitrary constants are your Lagrange multiplier. And often that Lagrange multiplier ends up having a physical meaning that you may or may not know at the outset. For instance, for the case of the red blood cells are minimizing the, uh, to keep the volume the same everywhere, the Lagrange multiplier ends up adopting uh, the physical interpretation of the pressure inside that cell. And so in order to maintain that uh, fixed volume, the, the pressure inside that cell might be different. Okay, so that's one approach. The second approach, um, which is commonly used in a lot of numerical routines, finite element analysis and such, is what's referred to as the penalty function method. And in this approach, what you're doing is you basically say, you, we're gonna add some other constraint to this and we're gonna penalize varying from that constraint. This is, uh, these, these, uh, these approaches are, are both equivalent. They'll both get you the same answer. It's just that depending on your problem, one might be uh, really computationally challenging and one might be trivial. One might be really analytically uh, straightforward, but uh, the other one might be a little uh, complicated to work out analytically. So they're both different approaches that you can try kind of depending on your problem to see what will help you minimize that functional. The penalty function is often used in contact problems. So you have a, an object that's gonna come and interface with a, a surface. And what you do is you basically say, all right, this object can go anywhere, but if it goes past here, there's gonna be something that's pushing back on it that, 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 that um, penalizes the uh, energy of it trying to go through the table. So it helps with various contact problems. All right, hopefully you kind of understand why this is useful and the two approaches, and then we'll jump into them. We'll do kind of one after the other and we're gonna do it a little bit generically. So it's probably gonna seem uh, maybe a bit mathy and theoretical. I think there's at least one problem on the homework that you'll get that utilizes the Lagrange multiplier. So you'll get a chance to practice this. Okay, actually, before I introduce the Lagrange multiplier method, let me first say, let me first come over here and say, let's draw out our functional. So our, our functional, in this case, I'm gonna call it I, I don't know why. Um, so we'll say it's i and it's going to be a function of both u and v, which are both functions of x. And we can write that i is equal to the integral between two points, a and b, of our Lagrangian, which is going to be f of x. And now x depends on u, and we'll say it depends on u prime, v, and v prime. I kind of picked this, oops, arbitrarily. Like we could have chosen to go to U double prime and V double prime. We could have uh, just looked at U and just looked at U and U prime and U double prime. But for, for the sake of um, kind of illustrating this problem, we're gonna pick two dependent variables which both depend on X. And we'll 
look at the derivatives of those. We're going to write our constraint in a way that's going to look really kind of almost useless, or at least hard to recognize what, what it's trying to do, but I'll explain it in a second. Or it's the constraint is just in terms of our dependent variables and their derivatives. And we say that our constraint is zero, equal to zero. What does that mean? What it means is that, for instance, let's go back to the um, red blood cell analogy and let's go with the idea that we'll say we want to find the shape but we want to fix the surface area we don't want the surface area to uh, stretch because red blood cells will basically break if you stretch them okay so what we would say is that the difference so the constraint in that case would be like the area of the deformed cell minus the area Oops. Of the initial cell should be zero. And then you could parameterize area in terms of um, your geometry, which might involve your dependent variables or derivatives or curvatures of, the, of your dependent variables. So this is the way this constraint is set up. So it's something like take the, the form thing minus the initial thing, and what that difference should be zero. We want to make sure that that difference is always zero. And if, and that will, if, we, if that difference is always zero, then we're saying that the area of the red blood cell is not changing and we're looking at shapes of it. So that's how to interpret what that constraint means. Some function of our dependent variables is equal to zero. And then the, you have to kind of input the physics of that function for you. Okay. There's one thing that I want to, um, point out, which starts to bring our notation closer to the notation you're going to see in the literature. So we've been doing stuff by saying like, okay, um, we're going to take like u and look at u plus epsilon eta, right? And that's our perturbation. And then we end up doing a bunch of Kind of variational calculus uh, tool tricks uh, on this perturbed function to bring it all back to what the actual thing we want is, which is defined as u. So in this case, what you'll typically see is that this quantity is often going to be written as delta u. We do the same thing here. So we could say, well, what if I'm looking at v? The perturbation there might be like v plus epsilon, uh, I don't know, let's pick a different variable, epsilon phi, and we'll say, okay, typically you'll see this written as the first variation of V. The same thing uh, applies to Say u prime, which we've been writing as u prime plus epsilon eta prime. This becomes delta u prime. That would be the quantity that you need to do your uh, uh, integration by parts on. And finally, v prime, you should interpret as v prime plus and one of the things that's really nice is there's a very straightforward way to calculate the first variation of your functional in this notation we can kind of take the time if we want to to like show that these are equivalent but i think for the sake of time i'm i'll just kind of leave that exercise up to the reader you don't have to trust me um so for instance let's look at if we're looking at a functional that's u that depends on little u then we could calculate the first variation of u by simply doing this so we would say the first variation of u is equal to 
the partial derivative of u with respect to the quantity that you're varying. So in this case, let's say it's with respect to u times the first variation in u. And if these things, if you have that it's u and v, then this becomes the first variation of u equals derivative of u du, variation u plus derivative of u dv, first variation of v. And if we do, let's say u and u prime, then we get the first variation in u is equal to the derivative of u with respect to u plus the variation in u. And now we have something that we have to do integration by parts on there. So this notation really helps us kind of skip the the detailed kind of Gateau derivative um, that we've been doing, uh, which is really like fundamentally what's happening. And this allows us to kind of work a little bit faster uh, when calculating these variations. So for instance, take a second and see if you can tell me um, if we know that our functional is i, for equilibrium, we know that the first variation in i should equal zero. So take a minute and see if you can jot down what this quantity is in terms of variations in uh, the dependent variables that are written in the functional above. Hopefully you find something that looks like this. Did people get something similar? Yeah. All right. Okay, so the idea here is that U and V need to satisfy the constraint. So let's write this down. U and V need to be chosen in such a way that they satisfy when you insert them into G, that G of U 
u prime v and v prime equals zero. The way we do this, the way we ensure that u and v satisfy this constraint is we say, okay, well, we're also going to ensure that that the first variation in G is equal to zero. Now that's straightforward to calculate as well. It's going to look basically the same, except we replace Fs with Gs and we don't have an integral at the moment. U. Just for clarity, and this might be redundant and you might already or obvious, I guess this might be obvious to you, but in case it's not obvious to you, um, there are, I'll pull this over here, um, and I'll go back in just a second. Um, D of something, ordinary derivative. That means that you're taking the derivative and there's only one independent variable. Oops. This is a partial derivative. Here, since we can differentiate G with respect to U and V and U prime and V prime, there are multiple things that we could be looking at in terms of how G changes as we change U or V or U prime or, U or V prime. And therefore, you're seeing that enter as a partial derivative. And the third little D is this quantity here. Which is the actually and this little delta. Uh, raised to some power is the power by uh, variation of it, which is basically saying like um, perturb, if in the case of u, let's pretend u is a, like a displacement, perturb the displacement a little bit, or think about it in terms of like a pendulum. You have this pendulum hanging down, you're going to take that end of the pendulum and just kind of perturb it a little bit and ask what happens. Does, does it go back to where it started? Does it stay there or does it go somewhere else? And so you're basically perturbing the displacements in this case. And then by considering all the possible things you could perturb in your system, in this case, U, V, U prime, V prime, then you end up with a pertur perturbation of the functional that contains all of them. That functional might be the energy, uh, or it might be something simpler than that, like the, the area. Okay, that was just a little notational aside. Okay, so the steps that you need for the Lagrange multiplier is to get here and then take this quantity and multiply it by an arbitrary parameter. So I'll say step one is multiply the thing in red This arbitrary parameter is almost always given the Greek symbol lambda. So if you see a lambda entering some sort of variation of calculus problem, it is almost certainly a Lagrange multiplier. The next step is we are going to integrate that product of lambda times that stuff in red over the interval. In this case, our interval is between A and B. And 
And then the third step is add that result to the variation in I. Okay, not bad. It's really pretty straightforward because now we can get to what we want, which is we can say that the integral from A to B of all this stuff, oh boy, all right, I'll show you all this stuff out. Df du, called variation in u, plus df du prime, first variation in u prime, df dv, actually I want to change this thing to a square, um, times the first variation in v, And now we're going to add to that lambda times all that stuff that I underlined in red. So it's going to be dg du, first variation in u, All right, everybody with me so far? I'm gonna skip a step here, but now we see that here, 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 and here are quantities we need to integrate by parts. Our goal, once we get to this step, is to collect terms based on what variational parameter they multiply. Remember, for the stuff that's going to live inside the integral, not the boundary terms, but the things that's going to live inside the integral, in this case, we should only have two quantities. The first quantity is going to multiply the first variation in u. The second quantity is going to multiply the first variation in B. That's going to be what happens as, as a result of the integration by parts. For the sake of kind of simplicity, we will say, so, so now we're going to kind of, uh, I guess, step four. Is integrate by parts. Step five is um, we're going to say that these variations at the endpoints are equal to zero. For, the, for this sake, that means we can, you know, simplify our life and throw out those boundary terms. But in the case that, that you've encountered a boundary value problem, the fact that these equal zero doesn't necessarily mean ignore them, it means those are your boundary conditions. That something can be arbitrary at that point, so therefore that can inform you about other parts of it. We learned that during the uh, problem with the elastic last class. So, so you can, for now, I'm going to kind of just ignore those terms, but those boundary terms satisfy, those are equations. They're going to give us boundary conditions. Okay. So the result of integrating this thing by parts is, oops, sorry, I forgot to say one thing. This whole quantity equals zero, of course, because this is just, uh, let's say it a different way. Let's say over here, let's say this is delta i 
plus lambda delta G. And that whole quantity equals zero. Okay. Questions? All right, let me show, maybe the questions will emerge uh, after this next step. So let me first show you, okay. We're now gonna say that we need to, we're gonna integrate by parts. This is int by parts. And the result of integrating by parts is that our, the quantity that we're seeking to minimize looks like df du. minus lambda dg du minus, now we're gonna have derivatives here. These are emerging from the integration by parts. Which that is a step that I've skipped here. I'll highlight some stuff in a second. You'll notice that everything that multiplies delta u has derivatives with respect to u. And this, the, similarly, we'll have this whole quantity is gonna be all relative to derivatives in, in v. Remember, I know that this is very symbolic and very like um, removed from uh, a kind of ver uh, a problem that you can kind of bite into. But think back to the red blood cell problem. We'll pretend in our head that F is the total elastic strain energy of that red blood cell. We'll pretend that G is the surface area of that blood cell and U and V are kind of displacements maybe on the, that live on the surface of that, of that cell. So what we're saying is we wanna find the shapes, we wanna minimize F with respect to those displacements. What are the displacements that will correspond to the lowest possible energy state for this red blood cell? However, we also want those displacements that we find to satisfy the constraint that the surface area of that blood cell, blood cell shouldn't change. And so we also have to make sure that when we insert U and V into G, we get zero. Because G is our way of saying, oh, for the red blood cell case, it means the area of my deformed cell minus the area of my initial cell. Maybe the area of my initial cell is a sphere. The area of my deformed cell is that weird donut-like shape with a, with a kind of tight spacing where that hole should be. All that we're doing here is trying to find for instance, you know, U and V of this, that describe the shape of this, of this deformed red blood cell, but don't allow its surface area to change. All right, questions. Um, I have a question um, for uh, Delta V prime, are, are we uh, representing it as um, D 
d dx times delta v, which is why we have it outside the parentheses. So delta v prime. So, sorry, hold on. Are you talking about here? Um, yeah, I mean, initially the, the, in, the, in, the, in the previous equation, um, delta i plus lambda delta g, mm -hmm. we, have, um, we have a partial derivative of delta u prime um, times, um, times uh, like delta g over delta u prime times delta u prime. Mm -hmm. um, so are we converting that to, are we just representing it differently in the, um, the IVP equation? Uh, no, no, good question. So um, what we've done is we've taken any quantity that has derivatives of our variation and we've integrated by parts. Remember what integration by parts is going to do. It's going to take the integral of some uh, UDV and turn that into something that's like UV minus the integral of V du. Right. So what, that, what that means is you're going to get kind of additional derivatives appearing, um, which is the kind of what we're seeing here is that through the integration by parts, if you flip back to maybe two lectures ago, I think in your notes, then where we go through kind of this, uh, we go through this process of integrating our parts. What you end up finding, uh, actually, hold on. Let me let me just pull it up. It'll be easier instead of me just talking. Here. So here's what I wanted to show you. So the integration of L in this case, L is either F or G. So you know it's the it's the uh, the different parts of our of our Lagrangian with respect to the derivative of y prime times eta prime. Now here eta prime is just uh, the variation of y prime. Right. Okay. So the integration of parts yields some term that occurs in the boundary, which we're ignoring for right now. We're ignoring that because we're saying, well, the boundary terms, this is going to be exactly zero at those points. We could use those as boundary conditions, but for right now, we're going to ignore them. And then it gives you this as the result of that integration of parts, which is take the quantity that you're initially dealing with, take the derivative of it with respect to the independent variable in the problem, which is x. And then that term now multiplies the, uh, in this case, eta, in our other case, either du, sorry, delta u or delta v, no longer uh, with a derivative there. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. So this form is exactly what you're seeing here, except now we have two things, right? This is kind of like both of them kind of got lumped in there. There's like a, a superposition of df dv prime plus lambda dg dv prime. Right. But that's all we're seeing. This is the result of integration of parts. So let me highlight that for everyone. So this is the Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Okay. We can write this in a little bit of a more compact way. But the thing I want to point out is that what we're going to end up with here are we started with two equations. Right, we had the equation that delta i was equal to zero and that delta g was equal to zero. What we're going to end up with are three equations and three unknowns. What are the three unknowns? Well, we started out wandering, wanting to know u and v, but now we also need to know 
our uh, our unknown kind of arbitrary constant that we added to the problem lambda. This always happens with the Grange multiplier problems. You end up with an with an extra equation to solve for an extra unknown. And that's why this can be computationally tricky. And then the, the benefit of the, as we'll see for the penalty method problem is that uh, we don't introduce any unknowns, any new unknowns. And so therefore we don't have any additional equations added to solve it. There's, a, there's another down trade off on that side. We'll talk about that in a minute. But for right now, I want you to recognize that this, let's go with pink. Let's see here. This quantity, this is one equation. This is a second equation. And it might not, they might not look like equations, but I want you to remember that <clears throat> one of the kind of uh, like the fundamental lemma of the calculus of variations is that if you have this thing that I've kind of put braces around in pink that multiplies delta u, if delta u is arbitrary, but the product of those two things has to be equal to zero, then the stuff I highlighted in pink has to be equal to zero. So let's write this down over here. So equation one is going to look like this. I'm going to pull out the partial derivative here. So let me show you. I'm going to write this as d by du. Actually, let me just, my handwriting is terrible. Let me do this close up a little bit. So one equation is going to be, oops, d by du. Of f plus lambda g. All I've done is I've factored out that operator, the differential operator, minus d by dx times d by du prime of f plus lambda g. Again, I factored out a different differential operator here. This differential operator. Um, take service with respect to u prime. That's equal to zero. This is just the pink stuff that I put right here on, the, on this first one. I just factored out this and this, and then I factored out this and this to get here. Okay. Equation two, pretty much the same. It's just all of these. So it's d by dv. F plus lambda G minus D by DX. And our third equation is the constraint itself. G, U, U prime, V, V prime, equals zero. And you're left trying to solve for three equations with three unknowns. We started with two equations and two unknowns. We couldn't solve them. We said, well, let's add a Lagrange, an arbitrary uh, parameter that's going to help us ensure that our constraint is satisfied. But now we don't know what that arbitrary parameter is. And so now that becomes part of our problem. So we've kind of helped ourselves and then added a little bit more work to, to, along the way.
What do you think? Questions? All right, let me quickly show you the penalty function method and then I'll set up a problem for you to do because I have a feeling this just all seems like you follow the notation, but you're not really sure if you could uh, actually act, uh, solve this problem. I actually have a quick question. Yeah. Uh, and this feels like really, really dumb, but. <laughs> Probably, <it's not. laughs> I, okay, so Lambda is unknown, but I guess just because everything is symbolic right now, mm -hmm. like, is it U and V that are also unknown or is it F and G that are also unknown? I think I'm just like struggling totally. to figure let's, out a little bit what the end game is. No, no, that's not a dumb question at all. It's actually like kind of the heart of this thing. So let me zoom out and go over here. Um, again, let's go back to our our red blood cell shape problem. So the red blood cell shape, think about the elastica. The elastica shape we found by um, taking the total potential energy, saying let's ignore kinetic energy, total potential energy and minimizing it over the length of the bar. And that total potential energy uh, is, and for the case of the elastica is like the strain energy. The strain energy depends on where you are in the bar and um, what your independent and, and dependent what your independent and dependent variables are. So for here, for the red blood cell case, let's take F to be the, the, the energy, the elastic energy of the red blood cell. And the elastic energy of the red blood, red blood cell is going to depend on um, uh, let's say U and V are displacements in uh, uh, on the shape of the object. So it's going to depend on uh, how, you know, if, 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 if two material points are displaced a lot, that's going to lead to more strain energy. If two parts are bent a little bit, that's going to lead to more strain energy. So the energy in the red blood cell is going to depend on U and V. The constraint here is saying that our area is not changing. Let's say that we can calculate our area of our red blood cell and it's just some function of U and V. If, so if we know U and V, we can calculate the area and we can calculate the strain energy and we can say, let's find the strain energy that's the lowest. We do that using just the calculus of variations technique. So U and V are what we wanna know. Because if we know U and V, then we can calculate the strain energy we can, and we can ensure that our energy is um, uh, minimized. So U and V are the first things we don't know. We say, well, in order to satisfy the constraint that the area shouldn't change, we take that constraint and we multiply it by um, something. Now, the nice thing about the Lagrange multiplier is the fact that it often has a physical interpretation. Well, I mean, it always does. It's, it's often, you're often able to figure out what it is. Um, so in this case, for the red blood cell case, if we're saying we don't want the surface area to change, we would need to calculate the surface area by determining U and V. And then something needs to be resisting surface area change in that red blood cell. So it turns out in this example that what would resist surface area change? Well, it's surface tension. Surface tension is a material property that kind of gives rise to, you know, a, a, a change in the energy of your system when you change the surface area. There's a cost to creating area. That cost is scaled by the surface tension. We could think about this in terms of pressure. So we could throw everything I just set out the window and say, same problem. The, we want to find the shape of the red blood cell. 
And we want to say, we, we want to make sure that whatever shape we find, we want the volume to not change. Okay, we do the same thing. The shape is going to be dictated by U and V. The volume would be dictated by integrating over that shape. So it's going to be integrating over some function of U and V. Now the Lagrange multiplier that's going to enforce that our volume doesn't change is going to be something that kind of changes uh, proportional to volume. In that case, it turns out if you go through and do it, the thing that is kind of regulating volume changes makes sense. It's the pressure in the thing. If, you're, if your uh, structure is, is deforming, but in, in keeping the same amount of volume in there, you need to have that, the pressure that's within there kind of regulating that. And the, it turns out that the Lagrange multiplier is exactly the pressure here, uh, within, that, within that cell. So the unknowns are the, the dependent variables U and V. They let you calculate F and they have to be chosen in such a way that they satisfy G. If G of that stuff equals zero. So putting it in a different way, if you find U and V and you stick them into some uh, function G that takes variables U and V, you should get zero out. Does that help? Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Other questions? Yep. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so one thing I was thinking about, so before we did the Lagrange multiplier, we had two equations and two unknowns. Um, and so like we could solve that, but maybe it's more like a convenience thing, as you were saying, like it makes it, maybe there's a little bit more work, but. It, mm, okay, good question. So the yeah. question is kind of like, why we had two equations and two unknowns, why can't we just solve that? And the answer is you can, but you're probably, but in this case, you're not solving the problem you want to. So for instance, if I said, um, I'm trying to think of a good example. So if you try, again, go to the red blood cell shape. If you don't put any Lagrange multipliers on there saying that you need volume to be constrained to not change, it might say that the, the best shape for this red blood cell is just to like inflate into a balloon. And you would say, well, that's, well, it can't do that because if it does that, it'll explode. Like the red, the red blood cell can't get bigger, but the math doesn't know that. It's almost like saying if I was to like have something sliding off of a hill and I was gonna be like, okay. I mean, this is a homework problem you're gonna get to do. It's like a, you take a bowl, like imagine like literally like a cereal bowl, flip it upside down and uh, put an ice cube on it and let that ice cube slide off of it. At some point, if that bowl is steep enough, that ice cube is just gonna start sliding and then just kind of fall off of the thing. Like you can imagine if I, do I have anything here? Not really. Uh, you can imagine if my bowl was actually like a spear. So I take a spear, I put an ice cube on the top of the spear and I said, let the ice cube fall off the spear. You can say, what angle does it fall off the sphere? Like, at where, at what kind of part does it fall off? The solution without a Lagrange multiplier, the Lagrange multiplier in that case is going to help you make sure that the ice cube kind of sticks to, <laughs> stays on the sphere and, and it doesn't just kind of just go off. Like, it doesn't just kind of fall down, like right through the center of it and just say, well, whatever, it'll just go, it'll fall off immediately. It's, it's a way of kind of ensuring that um, yeah, I, I guess it's, right? it's the way that you're adding the physics into the problem in a sense. Like you're kind of saying like, well, I, I want to, let me give a good example. The answer, I guess, is yes, you can solve it that way, but you're going to be missing kind of some physical ingredients that will lead to a solution that is mathematically correct, but not physically modeling your system. And so the example problem we're going to do in just a minute is one in which we 
try to um, think about uh, bending beams. And we do so in such a way that um, we want to not neglect kind of shearing when a beam bends. You think about ME305, you like, you neglect shearing at first, then you come back and say, oh, there's a transverse shear stress, let's add that back in there. Um, and so you could solve that problem without subjecting it to the constraint that you know, certain angles in there need to, be, need to be matched up, but you're gonna get a problem, you're gonna get a solution that only describes the behavior of beams that don't shear, which would be the equivalent of like taking a, post -it, a stack of post-it notes and bending that. Those things, they slide past each other really easily. You get kind of like that splayed edge that kind of looks like this. Uh, you can kind of see it. If you enforce there to be some shear there, then it has, you might be enforcing it so that the edge of that thing kind of stays exactly the same and you get a different, uh, a different model for how the beam is going to behave. So yeah, it's a good question. But basically the Lagrange, and again, this is kind of like, maybe it's easier. Uh, yeah, I guess I should have gone with this example to begin with. Like um, if I was to say, take, oh, let's see what I can do here. Here's a, here's a good one. If I was to say, let's hang this. Okay, what's the shape of this cable? We could find, we could write down an equation, minimize the functional. It's going to be the minimum, it's going to be whatever minimizes the bending energy of this cable. But if I put this cable right here, uh, those at home who can't see it, uh, hold on, let me do this over here. Okay. Can you see my chair? Reese, could you set that camera down? You guys can see the chair now, right? Okay. All right. So if I'm I'm trying to find the shape of this this cable, I could find this just by minimizing the bending energy of the cable. But the shape now is a lot different. The cable didn't change at all, except there's now a constraint that doesn't let the center of that cable go below the top of this thing. And so that would be the constraint that says, oh, there's a point there. So the shape of the cable can't be this because it's going to contact something. That constraint is, is essentially adding some of the physics that you're interested in back into the problem. It's not a problem of just minimizing the strain energy of the, of the cable. It's minimizing the strain energy of the cable while being aware that the sh there are some shapes that are not allowed. Why are they not allowed? Because they would have to pass through a material. That's not OK. So, Hopefully that helps kind of illustrate the, the problem a bit. Okay, let me quickly give you the penalty function and then I want, I want to have you work on uh, minimizing uh, and solving a particular problem. And if there's more questions, just throw them at me right now. I'm happy to I'd rather us this makes sense. The penalty function is the Lagrange multiplier method satisfies the constraint exactly, but it comes at the cost of having an additional equation and an additional unknown. Now we're choosing a pretty simple system of equations, but you can imagine that kind of as you're scaling up, the numerical complexity of solving something is going to increase a lot if you have, if you're just adding more unknowns and more equations to solve. So a different approach is the penalty function method. This satisfies the constraint approximately, but it has the benefit of not adding any additional equations and any additional unknowns. So in the penalty function method, what you say is that I'm going to take my two unknowns, u and v, and I'm going to have my, my penalty function p. And I'm going to say I will take my initial 
uh, my initial quantity that I'd like to minimize. And I'm going to add to that a penalty parameter, gamma. Now you're probably looking at this and being like, you just said there wasn't an additional thing. What is gamma? Gamma is not unknown. Gamma, we just say it's a huge value. We like literally give it a really large value. And we take that large value and we multiply it by the integral of our constraint squared. So we're adding the quadratic term here. So you're going to add you're going to take your constraint, square it, integrate it over your domain, multiply it by a really big number. What's that really big number? Well, typically what you're doing is you're doing this numerically. And what you're doing is you're saying, um, well, I'm going to pick a small big number and see what I get for my answer. And then I'm going to increase gamma and see how my answer changes. And what you're looking for uh, is your solution to converge. And basically you wanna kind of pick the biggest value of gamma where you don't really see much of a difference in your, in your solution. And by solution, I mean the values you find for U and V. So what you're doing is basically saying, okay, I, I wanna, I'm gonna penalize this behavior. So in the case of that problem, it would basically be saying like, sure, that thing could go through the chair, that cable could go through the chair, but it has to overcome this massive energetic hurdle to do so. And that penalizing of that deformation helps you find the true shape and as long as your kind of penalty function is, is large enough. So then once you have this new P, uh, everything else kind of behaves the same. You say, well, now I wanna ensure that the first variation in P is equal to zero. And what you get are two equations and they look like this. DF du, that doesn't look like du. I'm skipping a step to get here, but I, I think it, it would be worthwhile for you to go through carrying out the first variation in P. Now you can see why I introduced it as, or it's always introduced as gamma over two, because as a result of the minimization process, that two uh, gets canceled out when you're taking a derivative of that quadratic, right? G squared, what derivative of G squared is gonna give you a two, it's gonna cancel out with the two. And so then the equations you actually solve don't have a pesky two in there. I'm just writing this down for the sake of kind of demonstrating the fact that the result is two equations and two unknowns. The two unknowns are U and V. And as gamma goes to infinity, these solutions for U and V Uh, approach the true solution.
So in this case, the constraint is satisfied approximately. There are no additional unknowns added. Generally, if you're doing something numerically, the penalty function method is a kind of more common uh, approach. If you're doing calculations analytically, uh, the Lagrange multiplier approach is probably the, the one you're more likely to encounter. Yeah, question. Is the penalty parameter sometimes called the regularization parameter? Have you heard that before? I've heard that term. I don't know. Good question. I'll, I, I don't know. I, should, I'll, I will Google that. <laughs> Um, that's a good question. Um, so, so maybe I missed something here, but if we have no additional unknowns, does this mean that for gamma, we just like literally just plug in like a random super big number or like what are we supposed to do with gamma? Yes, exactly. And that's kind of what I mean by what you're typically doing in these cases is you're doing this numerically. So for instance, you're trying to solve the the, the exact problem I showed you, the, the elastica that's coming into contact with a with a point. Really hard to solve that analytically. So what you do is you solve it numerically and you say, okay, well, I know the energy um, and I want to ensure that it doesn't pass through this point. So I'm gonna penalize deformations that, that would lead to a shape that goes through this point. And exactly, you set it arbitrarily, you calculate the shape and then you change gamma, you make it slightly, either if you start with a huge number, you make it smaller or you start with a small number and you start making it bigger until your solutions for U and V converge. Meaning you keep changing gamma, but your answers don't change. And that's kind of the magnitude of gamma that is required for kind of convergence of your solution. Really common in contact mechanics problems because contact mechanics problems are really hard because you often don't know when or where or what portion of your object is in contact with the surface at, at any given time. And that's challenging because you have kind of like a, how do you impose boundary conditions if you don't know where the boundary is? So contact mechanics problems are difficult and often kind of require this like numerical uh, penalization of certain behaviors to help you um, ensure that you don't deform in ways that are physically not possible. But yeah, it's a, it's a, it is a, a, a value you assign and you kind of change it to see how your solution changes and look for convergence. I feel like I think, I'm pretty sure we're doing the same thing in our last one of our things. But yeah, basically like there's ways to solve for the ideal, uh, we call regularization parameter, so penalty parameter. Um, yeah. I, it's, I would imagine, I have a feeling it is. It is a, it's a tricky thing to find, but yeah. Yeah, and if you're lucky, you can connect gamma to a physical thing. Like gamma and lambda are, they're related. They're both kind of doing the same thing. There's a, you know, there's a reaction force from that chair that's gonna be, that would be the Lagrange multiplier. There's a, if you did the pressure problem, you're gonna get a value that looks, for gamma that looks like the pressure in the cell, you just might not be able to physically interpret that value unless you did additional experiments or numerics to say like, oh, okay, gamma is actually this thing. But oftentimes you're not necessarily interested in gamma. If you're doing a contact mechanics problem, like I don't, all I want to know is like, what's the shape of my object as it comes into contact with all these different things? I just want to make sure that my object doesn't adopt some crazy shape that is like, has its, my arm sticking through the wall, which doesn't make any sense. I should be able to, okay, well, there's gonna be something that penalizes my arm going past this point. And that's all it is.
Let's see here. Can we do this? I think we can. All right, so here, let me try, let me have you try one out to see if this helps at all. We're gonna do the one I just said, not the blood cell one. I should have, I should have written that one down. Um, so for example, so we wanna find the shape of an elastic beam. So I want you to do is minimize the following function. I'm gonna call it capital pi. Capital pi is often used as a way of uh, in elasticity, noting the total potential energy of your system. So we'll say the total potential energy of our elastic beam can be found from the deflection and the kind of angle change along the along the x-axis. Um, which is basically this is like a curvature. I think I, uh, so this is like D, yeah, I think, this is, I think so. Uh, actually, no, it's not, sorry. It's not a curvature, sorry, I'm mistaken. The derivative of it will be a curvature. It's just saying, look at just the angle relative to the X axis. And so it's, there's angles in all different directions. We're gonna look at just that one. So what does this mean? It's like, take the integral from the unit. L B over two times my curvature squared. We did this last class. We did it for the fully nonlinear case here. We're just gonna simplify our life. And we'll say there could also be a distributed load that acts to deflect the object. So this could be like gravity or some um, force per unit length maybe that's acting on on the not gravity, sorry. It, should, it could be a force per unit length on the beam. So maybe you have a beam and you have some like water resting on top of it. And maybe there's also a shear force being applied vertically at the edge of the beam. I'll draw this for you. So this could be like That is not right. There's a shear force F over here. And we'll say that there is a distributed load. It looks to be uniform because we didn't say it depends on X. We'll call it Q. This is typical Euler Bernoulli beam theory. No, nothing different. This is just a cantilever with a uniform load uh, and a point load at its end. Great. But we're gonna say, hey, we actually know something that connects the slope of the beam to the rotation of the middle plane. You don't need to understand physically where this is coming from. That's what you would get out of an elasticity course or an advanced mechanics and materials course. But I'll just tell you that the constraint we wanna satisfy is this. And it's that we want the the slope to be the opposite of that angle there. So when you add those two up, they cancel each other out. And we'll give the conditions that W at zero and the angle at zero are zero. Okay. Why don't you see with the remaining 20 minutes, I'm gonna set you up in breakout rooms, see if you can find it, the solutions here. Now remember, when you're doing a variation of calculus problem, typically what you are, the, the quote unquote solution is, is you're gonna take this functional and arrive at the governing differential equations and the governing boundary, natural boundary conditions for your problem. So you're not gonna get the solution for the beam. What you're going to get is an equation that lets you solve for the solution of the beam.
I know it's less satisfying, but that's that's what this allows you to find the governing equations. So yeah, let's let's try to find the governing equations here. I will split you up into breakout groups and we'll see what we can do here. All right. I think everyone is back. We're running out of time. I know you probably didn't have time to finish it all uh, in the breakout rooms, but I wanted to have a chance just to wrap up all together. So what I'm hoping, if you first do with the Lagrange multiplier method, what I'm hoping is you took this thing and you added it uh, to the integral of uh, lambda times G over the same domain. And the result should be three equations. One of them is obvious because we started with it. That's the first, that's from G. And then the other two, this one should look familiar. It's basically, you might've gotten, it's basically B times the curvature squared plus lambda is equal to zero. That looks like the Elastica equation that you're used to solving in mechanics of materials. This one should look a little bit weird. Uh, what do you do with it? Well, what you do with it is the, and the important takeaway here is this term here, which tells us that, that our Lagrange multiplier is the shear force. That is, let me physically explain what this means. In order to ensure that this constraint is met, that constraint being that the, there is a relationship between the transverse deflection and the rotation of the transverse normal. In order for that, to, that relation to be met, we need to account for the shear force and the shear strain occurring in the beam. This, if we go through this process, the, the resulting equations that you found here, if you got here, or if, you, if you eventually get here, are what are known as the Timoshenko beam theory. Timoshenko beam theory is Euler-Bernoulli beam theory, but you add to that uh, a contribution from the transverse shear stress when you bend it. Timoshenko beams are used to model thick beams that are bending or really uh, beams that have, uh, uh, that where, where shearing along the long axis is really important. So this is probably a harder problem to wrap your head around conceptually, especially if you're outside of the world of, of elasticity theory. But I guess the purpose in part was for you to go through this process of adding a Lagrange multiplier and minimizing. I know you probably didn't have time. So um, I'll send out the homework after class so you can have time to play with some of these. Expect it to be hard. My interest in the, and I, I would say this about the homework too. A lot of the homework problems I gave you are really, really classical problems. I don't view this homework as like a way for me to, uh, in general, for all the homeworks, I don't view them as a way for me to kind of, um, I guess, judge your ability in this class. I view them as a way for you to practice these techniques to learn this stuff. So there's a problem on there on the brachistochrone. Go read about the brachistochrone. It might help you find the answer. You can try it on your own first. I think that's the best way to learn. But then when you get stuck, go digging, go do some research and see what you found. The problem for minimizing the soap bubble shape, like there's volumes of literatures on, on soap bubbles and minimal surface areas, minimal surfaces. Same thing for that problem of the ice cube roll or the hula hoop, I think it is rolling off of a, off of a hill. Uh, to me, I want you to be able to get through these problems more so than I want to be able to kind of judge you on being, uh, getting them perfectly correct all by yourself. I want you to walk away having learned how to do the problems. So use your resources, just tell, you know, just let me know what you use and just be able to actually understand what you learned. Um, I know it's probably an atypical approach, but I, I, I don't know. I, I, I'm more interested in, in you learning the stuff than you getting the right answer. So tackle the homework. It's going to be challenging, but I think it's kind of a fun homework problem because I think the problems themselves are kind of things that you should look at as a mechanical engineer, especially a mechanical engineer with a graduate degree, you should be able to like, feel like, yeah, I could solve that. And I think it was kind of scary when, when we kind of sometimes can't. And so I think this homework will hopefully help you get to the point where you're like, oh yeah, that's a problem. I know, I, I think I can tackle that. Um, all right. 
I will see you all. Oh, last thing is that uh, I can't, I have to do office hours by appointment only. So if you have, if you need something, reach out to me via email. It's advising week, and I don't have. There's not enough hours in the day, and so I have scheduled advising times uh, during our typical office hours this week just to manage my um, fitting things in with my uh, simultaneous managing of my kids' um, work being at home for school. So. I, if there's questions that come up, reach out to me and we'll find a time to meet, but our, my regular office hours today, I have, I had to um, use them for advising time. So um, I hoped it would not be a problem since the midterm was due. I feel like there was probably less questions today than there would be, but if you need anything, just let me know. Thanks everyone. Have a good day. Thank you.